some quick words on the birth of uh, role-playing games, and after that, a lot of examples and subtypes and so on. So Dungeons and Dragons, you may have heard about this. It's the first example of modern role-playing games. It was invented by Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson, uh, and it was meant as an expansion to a, a war game called Chainmail because they wanted to go down on a skirmish level in these war games and see so individual heroes and what happens if you had like guerrilla fights and so on. They, they wanted more than just massive uh, divisions and platoons in the fighting games. And then that uh, that evolved and kind of so we want to see more about what this character is and what he's doing and, and so on. But uh, it's it's based on war game roots. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons is still the most known role playing game system. It's still heavily focused on character combat and uh, on stats and on rules, gaining loot, becoming better, and killing bigger monsters. There's some examples of great storytelling, but it's also quite black and white. I mean, I don't know if it's still that way in the fourth edition and I've copied fifth edition, but in third edition you had you had like uh, you had the holy warrior, the paladin who could detect evil, and anything that pinged when he detected evil was evil, so it was okay to kill it. That's how black and white it was. Yes. So in the early 90s, many of the Scandinavians were really fed up with this, and we started see, looking at what well, grayscale is so much more interesting for storytelling, for the nuances and so on. So we, we, we wanted something different. We also have a very big storytelling tradition in the Scandinavian region, Nordic region, the Icelandic sagas, and the long winters where you can't really do anything but just sit and talk and tell stories and so on. So it, it's very natural to us. And also, there's a really large association and, and, and club, youth club culture in, in the country, so it's also natural to <coughs> create clubs around this phenomena as well. So that's part of some of the reasons why we diverged from that uh, Dungeons & Dragons path. Uh, so yeah, we have some subtypes here in the Nordic region. Uh, we have tabletop. That's traditional role-playing games. Two to ten players, one to two game masters. It's played up one to three. Then we have something called freeform. It's again two to eight players. All these numbers are estimates. You can push, push on them in both directions, but it's a general estimate. Zero to two game masters, so you, this can be game masterless, and it's played up four to five, so you're getting out of the chairs now. Jeep form, that's a kind of a sub form of free form, except the Jeepers may be pissed if you call it that. Uh, two to eight players, zero to two game masters, you play step four to five. And lastly, LARP, live action role playing games. Ten to ten thousand players or more, one zero to a hundred game masters or organizers, as you would probably call them as well. And we're talking costumes, generally, uh, and, and uh, a 360 ideal, often. Uh, so you actually go out and you prepare a piece of land for this, this land, and it played it five to seven. So these are the general subtypes. But as soon as you, it, it also depends how you categorize this, depends on where you come from. I come from tabletop role playing games, so to me, uh, I might have a different opinion on what's a freeform game and what's a lab compared to Morgan, who comes from the lab tradition. So it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a matter of perspective. These are fluid, uh, these are set borders and set uh, definitions. Uh, again, to sum up, with the play depths uh, for your pleasure. This is also, it's a, a very crude try to attempt at, at the categorizing and, and you should be this problem more fluid and radiant than this, but if we have rules here and props over here, then tabletop is rule heavy and props light if you if you don't consider miniatures and dice props. Uh, freeform games don't have a no, lot of rules, they also don't have a lot of props, and labs they can have a lot of rules or not not very many rules, but usually they have a lot of props. This is really, really crude and wrong in so many ways, but it's a good way to, to understand the general idea. 
examples of tabletop role-playing games. Uh, it's uh, two sick players in the Game Master. They sit in, in, in somebody's living room around a table. There's a lot of miniatures and a lot of dice, sometimes. Uh, each player has a character sheet. There's stats for strength score and dexterity and intelligence. Uh, some skills and abilities related to whatever game system they're using. You use dice as a random element to 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 resolve most most conflicts and most uh, challenges. Yeah, this is uh, a lot of tabletop. General. Usually we see archetypical characters, especially in the Dungeons and Dragons uh, variety of tabletop: uh, knight, sorcerers, uh, backstabbing thieves, and so on. Uh, we see settings from fantasy, sci-fi, a vampire setting, or horror, and cartoon. That's a brilliant system for playing uh, Sunday morning cartoons, <laughs> uh, murder mysteries, and so on. Uh, it can be focused on storytelling or combat, and you can take a rule-heavy system and disregard the rules and still focus on the storytelling. But in 4th edition Dungeons & Dragons there are tools to, to uh, completely bypass any storytelling as, all, uh, as well. So you just I roll gather information, okay, you succeed, so you find out that the next quest object is in this time uh, town, okay, so we go there, okay, you roll two times on the skill survival skill list to get there, to see whether you encounter anything interesting, so, so you skip all the storage. LARP, live action role playing. It's, it usually, it, it used to be just the abbreviation, but now it, it's perceived as a noun of her in its own right, so it's, it's a term. You, you LARP, you go to a LARP, it's you, and you, you write it uh, with smaller case letters as well. It's uh, on the surface the most different to tabletop, and there are a lot of sub forms, a lot of settings, a lot of themes, pretty much anything you can imagine. You can have a small lab, dozens of players, maybe ten players, or you can have thousands. Usually the really, really big ones are focused on combat more than on, on character storytelling and so on. But you have costumes, you have props, and often a lot of them. The goal is to simulate the fictional world to the greatest extent possible. This again is wrong in a lot of cases, but it's a general rule. And there is no shared core experience, except for the really, really small labs. So as soon as you have a hundred players, it's, it, there's no way that everybody can experience the main storyline, because half of them will be in a different place when it happens. So an example of a uh, uh, lab that's focused on combat is Chris Live 5, the Warlock Farm. It's a 36 hour lab, medieval combat, you can see pretty costumes, very authentic. It's focused on the soldier's life, so they have battle groups and logistics and supply lines, combat morale, 460 players, uh, and it, it's very focused on, on the combat and, and tactics and so on. No character death, so you can either choose to flee or surrender or to become wounded and then you have to be uh, healed and uh, bandaged and so on. And there's an eight page rule set, which is a lot a lot of labs. Uh, in Scandinavia, in America, you'll have like a 150 page rule book. <laughs> so, so I'd say and, uh, Britain is also more rule heavy than, than uh, Scandinavian labs. But it, Scandinavian labs tend to be smaller. Uh, 1400 is the biggest larp in Sweden, and I think that's the biggest in Scandinavia. Uh, whereas in, say, Germany, you will have 8,000 people on a game. Uh, so, so there's a. <clears throat> the, the, it tends to not need as much rules when you're in a small group and so on. Even if it's combat. Carpool, that's maybe the counterpoint to uh, Chris Lab. It's a story about the prisoners in a surrealistic Danish prison camp. So it's, it's, it's the, the themes are powerlessness and dehumanization and what happens uh, to internally to a, a person that's in a camp and what they need to do and how much of their own personality they need to sacrifice in order to survive. Um, and choose between yourself and your loved ones and so on. 
So, uh, yeah, you, you're basically, uh, it, it's a dystopian near future Danish society where dissidents or people that the government decides are dissidents are put in a prison and they're there until they uh, admit to their sins and wrongdoings on live TV, after which they can get out of the prison and probably into another prison. Um, so they're all taken to, uh, to, to torture uh, once every cycle and everything is, is blacked out so they don't know what time of day it is and there's weird music in the background and so on. So. Uh, yeah. It isn't about gangs, it isn't about violence, it's, it's about the, the, the strategies that people need to use in, in, in camps like these, but also in refugee camps, a lot of this is happening. So it, this uh, scenario was, was an attempt at trying to give a glimpse of, of, of that as well, and, and give a, a chance to, for the players to try and explore that. Uh, so they got an old uh, factory warehouse and they did a complete 360 realistic uh, camp in there. And they could 360 block. means a 360 degrees illusion. Everywhere you look is the game, the energetic world. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And they could turn off and on the lighting to, to, to screw with people's uh, uh, Body signals about uh, is it day or night time and so on, uh, and getting getting uh, getting dinner in the morning, which also screws with your your body system. On, on. But it's morning. Why am I not? Why well, am getting lasagna? And the cook at the scenario talked about he even he was eating the same as the players because he just cooked lasagna even if it was, if it was eight in the morning, and even he felt really weirded out just because he got lasagna in the morning. And, the body saying, but this isn't, this is wrong, this isn't, isn't what I'm used to, it, it doesn't match with my internal clock. So, uh, it's 150 players, and uh, for many of the role players, they said it was the most uh, powerful role playing game experience they had ever received. Also, Papaya Badu, it's also a good example of, of where you can take a lap. And with in, in a different direction, it's a long time pervasive lab in Sweden, in Sweden, October, November 2006. So it's a combination of, of a 360 lab and uh, alternative reality gaming, pervasive gaming, and some urban exploration to boot. So um, 30 participants were playing themselves, but themselves occasionally becoming possessed by. Uh, dead revolutionaries from the past that are re-entering the world and are trying to prevent bad stuff from happening. Um, so it explored the fluidity of the borderlines between when you're role-playing and, and, and when you're being possessed by an evil spirit or a ghost or whatever. And uh, how that is actually kind of the same thing mm -hmm. in some ways. Mm -hmm. And so they used uh, a so lot of for 30 days. We can say that. I, yeah, this it's next. Slide. Okay. Sure. Uh, so they used a lot of uh, technology. So you you could you have trackers and use those trackers to find interesting spots around uh, the tree. Stockholm. Stockholm. Mm, 34 days around the clock. So it's it's going on for 30 days, and you decide when you are off game, just yourself, or when you are in game. And that that's, that's what, where it gets interesting because it cuts that borderline, right? Because you're actually playing yourself in your everyday life and you choose when you get possessed. So you're not never actually off game. You're just choosing when you want to play someone else or if you want to play yourself in your own life. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's where it becomes pervasive into your own life. So freeform, a couple of examples of this. Uh, so uh, two trade players, they get together somewhere. Quite often it's uh, in schools. So you have role-playing conventions in Scandinavia primarily that, that focus on freeform games. So you get together and then you have a time slot of four, five, or six hours and you go into the school classroom and then you play that specific freeform game in there. You don't need any props, you just need 
maybe one of the guys who's written this scenario, read the scenario before, or you just get the scenario handed out when you get go into the classroom and then you just skim through it and play it. So um, tabletop and labs, they usually uh, approach the story through simulation, so through the rules and I'm hitting you here, so that happens. Freeform doesn't really use that. Instead, it's freeform is the freedom to adapt the form to the story for every story. So you, you take the mechanics that are most suitable for telling the specific story with this specific theme. Um, so and, and using the right ones that facilitate that telling. Totally Is that different from improvisation? <sighs> you what, what, what did you say? How Is does that differ from improvisation? Uh, it's a form of improvisation. Yeah. It's like I would. I, I, the easiest stim stimulation is usually used in LARPs. It depends what LARPs. There's a lot of LARPs that use the exact same thing that they, you use free, free form techniques in the game. Uh, and 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 what how it differs from improvisation? A drama exercise? Not at all. Mm -hmm. Only it comes from different different angles. Therefore, it's called different things. Just like I call something LARP that he calls free form that a drama pedagogue would call to call drama. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, improvisation in front of an audience, well, there's the audience. That's the big difference between role playing and, and theater, if you want. Yes, that there is an audience. Yes? Does that, did that answer your question? Okay, so Trolikai, or Loyal Lackeys, is uh, an example of an early 90s uh, freeform, Danish freeform game. And it's an intrigue scenario, so we, we get like this Reservoir Dogs kind of the theme and the mood. The five criminals uh, ordered by the crime boss to, to show up uh, on the 15th floor of a large dilapidated office building. Um, they get a call on a landline in an otherwise empty room and they get informed that there's a sniper outside so if they leave they'll be shot dead. They also informed that the boss knows that one of the people, one of the five people inside the room actually pocket the, the diamonds that they were supposed to steal in the last failed diamond heist. Um, so, and they have informed that there's a, a gun underneath the table with one bullet. So that it's their job to find out who stole the diamonds and kill that person. And they're not allowed to leave before that or they all die. That's basically the premise. And then everybody, all players are, get a character sheet and they read through that character sheet and they, they have their character, but they also maybe know one or two bits of information about some of the other characters. And then the intrigue just progresses from there. And maybe there's another phone call a little later, or it turns out that one of the guys in there has a knife, and that complicates the situation, and, and so on. When I played it, I, um, I took the bullet out of the gun without any of the other people knowing it. So that's the third complication there that the game master and the scenario why it wasn't prepared for. So that complicated the situation further. But you can easily spend four or five good hours on this, just playing this. Uh, but it's a good example of, of how the instigating event, you have to go here, you get the phone call, and the diegetic framework uh, and the mechanics, there are, aren't really that many mechanics, but especially the instigating event and the diegetic framework just allows you to, to create this story collaboratively and if, in an emergent fashion. And if you play this again, something else will happen. 